Hello and welcome to the Grand Cinema Hotel, a podcast hosted by two friends who love cinema. I'm Oliver and I'm joined by my co-host Gus. Tonight you'll be staying in room 154, Decision to Leave, the newest film directed by Park Chan-wook. So go ahead, get comfortable and throw on that do not disturb sign as we untangle this web of love and decision to leave. What's going on, all my insomniacs? And thank you for checking back in to a special late night episode of the Grand Cinema Hotel. My name is Gus, and I'm joined by Alvaro. What's up, guys? And uh, we're here to talk about an exceptional, exceptional, entertaining film that we watched recently. Uh, that'd be Park Chan Wook's decision to leave. Uh, Alvaro, first thoughts, opinions. How do you, uh, how do you like this movie? So, dang, decision to leave. Um, I, I, I guess walking out of the theater the first time I saw it, I was really impressed by the um style of this movie honestly um i this year i ended up watching old boy so i'm not too exposed to his work from prior but i i do see different um a lot of things in common with both of them and and just the way that he really presents his characters and i think this movie is just really precise in its um craftsmanship and i think it really just uh is really good down to the director and i just really i think I, when i first saw this film i knew i enjoyed it and then when we watched it the second time before the podcast to just freshen up i actually enjoyed it more and um yeah it's just really a well-crafted film yeah definitely um i'm kind of in the same boat as you i have uh i you know i watched old boy when i was a small small child <laughs> i was one of the first dvds i saw uh one of my cousins who was a big dvd collector back then he he had invited me and my dad over and he was like oh i gotta show you guys this really like cool fucked up movie it's called old boy and um yeah i mean i don't really have i haven't really seen much of his work but that is a standout movie in my <laughs> my development of liking movies yeah it's one me and my dad have uh watched multiple times together so it although i'm not really versed in his filmography i just uh he has a special place in my heart and i know that he's a very um highly regarded director not just in korea but around the entire world um and i do think it's because of that style that you're talking about and I mean, he's mostly known for you know sex, violence, and revenge. Yeah, and these are very <laughs> entertaining topics to make movies about. Um, I wouldn't exactly say this movie is a step in a different direction, but it's just taking a different approach to these same themes that he's had throughout his um, throughout his time making movies. I, w- I would say it feels like the characters are more uh, quote unquote not in the niche end of th- end of the spectrum, and they're more relatable. And it's more um, accessible to a, you know, quote unquote normal person. Like you said, an old boy, um, it is more of like a crime type of setting. So I don't necessarily, obviously, there's certain people like you and me that like those type of films. But I think this film, we kind of talked about how there's two types of like, it's a mystery and it's a drama and it's like a love story. And it, it switches in between those really well throughout the whole film. And I think that's what really makes it... Um, kind of the second watch really solidified to me the way that it kind of maneuvers in between all of that how well crafted it was yeah i mean you mentioned that you you uh although you don't know much about him that his craftsmanship really stood out to you Mm -hmm. and um that is one of the things that he's really known for and i do think that he is a movie maker who uses all of the tools to his disposal you know he doesn't he doesn't hold anything back, like the genre blending, the editing, the the stories themselves. You know, he's very, I, I don't want to call him a maximalist because that's not how his movies come across. But he, it, when I say, when I think of a maximalist, I think of Baz Luhrmann, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Park Chan-wook does use all of those tools that are at his disposal as a filmmaker. And um, I think, <laughs> yeah, he... He handles these things very, very well. Like maybe may, a lesser director would probably make, you know, a movie that's not so great because you know, you're putting so much out there on the table. But somebody like him, who honestly I would say is like one of the like master filmmakers who's alive today. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wasn't surprised that this movie was just as good as like 
everybody says it is. <laughs> I think a great point that you had made was that um, the oh, I like lost my train of thought. Sorry there. Um, try, I'll go I'll see if I can get back to it. Okay. Well, I I kind of you know I wrote some things down. Um, these are kind of my thoughts and opinions. So uh, you know, it's the latest film. Uh, in, if you don't know, in Korea, they refer to them as like director and then like their name. So like director Park or director mm. uh, Bong, you know, stuff like that. So uh, the latest film from director Park is a complex romantic mystery thriller that is one of the most enjoyable films of the year. Um, while it's not the most complex mystery uh, in terms of the story, I thought it was one of the more complex portrayals of uh, love that I've seen in a very long time in a movie. <laughs> I'll, I mean, although I don't watch, uh, I wouldn't say this is a genre that I'm deeply interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, I do tend to kind of go elsewhere. But the chemistry between the two main actors, uh, Tong Wei and Park Park Hae Il, uh, is electric, honestly. And uh, they're they're doing a very intricate dance throughout this entire movie. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, I did think that they were two of the best performances I've seen this year. And that the film itself is just inherently cinematic. Like when I watch this movie and like I was talking about with all those tools that are at his disposal, um, he uses that to his advantage to make this like as this is going to sound dumb, but like as movie as possible, like shots uh, fading into other shots just because. <laughs> just because it fucking looks cool and it's like yeah. why not do it you know i love that when filmmakers just like why why am i gonna hold anything back why not do this crazy edit why not do this reverse mirror shot that looks amazing when the focus is pulling as every character you know when one character talks the other one goes out of focus like that was that's such a that's a thing that you see in a lot of movies but when it's really well done like that Boy, is it impressive to watch, you know? I think that that's that was a point that I was going to make is that you had previously talked about and it, it was about this point was that it's maximizing the medium is knowing that this is a this is a film. This is what you can do when you're telling a story in a film and using the editing at the advantage of really making you feel like when the character's having a dream sequence, it feels or looks like what a dream sequence would feel like. And I, th I think he just really, again, goes back to the craftsmanship that we're obviously have thrown the word around a lot. But I think that that's why the film can take a very simple premise and kind of make it a little bit more complicated. And something that I really thought the whole time was, this kind of sounded like a weird analogy, but like Tom and Jerry don't like each other and they're always trying to like chase each other. But throughout the whole series at the end, you kind of find out that they really actually like each other. And I think there's like, a, <laughs> I <laughs> there's, was not expecting this. Yeah. And I think there's like that, di <laughs> that dynamic here though, too, that like at first, you know, we, you have a cop trying to do what's right, but then later it kind of becomes both of them being in a tangled in a way, knowing that they need each other for basically what they would see see as i guess happiness in this movie satisfaction mm -hmm. yeah i would say the two characters are extremely unsatisfied with their positions yeah, in life it's not happiness it's more unsatisfied um yeah i mean this in the best way possible that like this film is like really exaggerated in a lot of ways um the the drama is ratcheted up the romance is ratcheted up the the filmmaking itself you know like you mm -hmm. said taking it uh using all those tools at his disposal um, and it really just conveys the story in a way that only like cinema can't, you know, like in, uh, you know, there's when you're writing a play, you can only do so much, you know, it has to be about the story. It has to be about the conversation and the dialogue, but, or, you know, when you write in a book, you can do whatever the hell you want. You can bounce from this chapter is 500 years ago. This chapter is now, but yeah, what I'm trying to say though, is that the, this movie is made in only a way, or this story is told in a way that only a movie could do it. Yeah. That's what I was trying to say. Exactly. Sorry. Got a little jumbled there. I think, <laughs> I think you had kind of talked about sometimes with the genre, it loses you a little bit when you kind of like are given the plot whole, well, oh, you didn't really think about what you, the movie's whole premise in the beginning was that you had suspicion that this person killed someone and then you get all the clues and then they give you one throw off and you're like, oh, I guess they didn't do it only for them to reveal like, Oh wait, they did do it. You know? And I think that's something you said, you like kind of struggle with, with the genre. And I think that is something that is, pre <laughs> <laughs> is prevalent in mysteries a lot. But I think because of the way this is made, it, it kind of elevates it to something you can't really compare to too many other films that are about this subject matter. 
Yeah, I mean, I do find some mystery films to be a little tedious, I would guess. I say I would say because some of them are done in a way where it's so obvious from the beginning, right? And it's just kind of like, okay, well, what's what's the obvious twist going to be at the end that I never could have seen coming because it wasn't it wasn't ever even alluded to. Like I never got a chance to even investigate this clue yeah and then the best ones do it in a way where like all this information is presented to you but then you still are you know interested in how it was how it came together is uh but i i I would i struggled with this film so i watched this film in two sittings because you know when you (laughs) any parent knows it's like impossible to watch a movie in one sitting (laughs) so the first time i got about an hour in and the first 30 minutes or so was pretty standard police procedural, you know? Yeah. And maybe that's why I was, mm, I don't want to say unsatisfied with the beginning, but I just kind of was like, this is extremely obvious, no? Like, my wife even told me that, too. She's like, it, wouldn't it be too obvious if this is what it was? You know? But I don't want to really get into that stuff yet. I don't even know how I feel about, like, spoiling this movie. Right. I do want to talk about the ending, but... I don't know about the actual beat by beat what's going on. You know, the meat and potatoes of the story. That is, it does seem like a kind of ruining. This is, again, like we said, such a pushing the medium and using the medium to its full power that it does seem like a disservice to kind of take away from you being able to go on that ride with their eyes closed as much as possible. Yeah, um, kind of moving off that subject a little bit. So I had very little knowledge of this film. Like, uh before I went into it, I had not seen the trailer. I still haven't seen the trailer. Mm-hmm. Um, I really just watched this on name recognition alone. I was Correct. like, oh, Park Chan Wook. Uh, I had been meaning to watch The Handmaiden, which came out like maybe six or seven years ago, I believe. And <laughs> like I was talking about with this movie, I ha- I've started The Handmaiden, but I have not finished it. But it's I was really enjoying that as well, what I did see. But uh, so as far as expectations go, I didn't really have any, honestly. Um, because I didn't even, I just knew it was like this detective story, you know, guy meets a woman, you know, very inspired by Vertigo. And now that I've seen the movie, I can definitely see yeah. those, uh, the blueprint, Hitchcock. you know, the, yeah, it's, 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 it's an extremely Hitchcockian movie, you know, like, uh, I do think that it welcomes that comparison though, too. Like I'm sure if you asked him, he'd be like, yeah, I fucking love Alfred Hitchcock. Yeah. Just because like, from what I do know about his filmography, that uh you know he's very inspired by the those types of uh genres like neo noir romance mystery and all that stuff but um i wasn't surprised you know once i did some research into the film that uh <laughs> a lot of people did kind of feel the same way they're like yeah i definitely see these these vertigo bones throughout this movie yeah i mean even in the way that i i told you before even in the way that some of the shots are framed it just seems um like just gorgeous in the same way that a lot of um, like vertigo is and a lot of its shots and the way that um the characters kind of intermingle with each other i think really did remind me of like a hitchcock premise yeah you know i think one thing that a lot of directors take from alfred hitchcock that you don't really see too much today and maybe this is why some of our favorite directors like him so much is because i feel like a lot of movie makers now the technology has kind of made it easy to be lazy. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like, well, why make this look so gorgeous? Or why do these complex editing techniques? Like, I don't know if it's maybe just because these things have already been done before and they're like, let's try doing something different. But I feel like a lot of people who really look up to Alfred Hitchcock are really great craftsmen. And like, I think of uh, Bong Jun ho I think of Park Chan-wook, I think of Guillermo del Toro, just these directors who really put like, everything into their movies and like the idea that like a movie should be as like let's make the best possible thing we can make you know and i don't know why alfred hitchcock is the guy who does that to people but we've seen recently like you know vertigo and uh psycho showing up on sight and sound Mm -hmm. like they do all the time and i don't think that's for nothing yeah i I think we had uh i think this came from we were listening to a qt interview but he kind of talked about like the Hayes Code and just like how Alfred Hitchcock was able to make certain movies and use the Hayes Code to his advantage. But I think that just kind of proves that you can, when you're set with the barrier and how do you work around that, kind of makes the film kind of um, 
you have to learn how to resonate your idea with the audience in a more creative way. And I think it really pushes to make the dialogue, I would say, or even maybe the premise of the story or the way that the chemistry is between the characters and who you pick as your actors really like becomes more important. And I think, like you said, the chemistry between the two main actors here is really what pushes this film. And I think some of the, the believe believability in this movie is just movie standards. But then some of the other of it seems like it's like towards the end when we get to our third act and some of like the emotions that are present, I think are very relatable um, and some of the most powerful emotions in the whole film. Yeah, the film goes from kind of a standard movie to, I don't want to say ridiculous, but like, yeah, very extreme mm-hmm. in the end. And like, it's a, it's a, it's satisfying because of that buildup. Yeah. And I thought, I think it's actually really interesting that you brought up the Quentin Tarantino uh, anecdote about the Hayes Code because um, I was doing a little bit of research, uh, uh, reading some interviews. Mm-hmm. So Park Chan Wook did an interview with the Los Angeles Times. And um, the reason I wanted to bring up bring this up was because you had mentioned the Hayes Code and uh, one of his decisions in making the movie was that he or that he wanted to make a love story that doesn't that that doesn't say the words I love you and the film is more about what's not said but what's observed by our two characters. And I thought one of the main themes throughout the entire movie was restraint of like how these yeah. two characters um, that we'll get into in a little bit that they uh, so much of this movie is them hiding their true feelings and they're not expressing their actual emotions. So it kind of felt like a self-imposed haze code, like uh, of how he wrote this movie. Mm-hmm. Like, okay. How do I make a love mo- uh, a love story where no one says I love you? And it's all just about the actions that we see. And like, uh, you, <laughs> it's kind of, damn, it's kind of hard to not, I want to kind of spoil it already, but you know, there's a big moment later on in the movie where it would be an "I love you" in a in a standard romance movie, but it's a it's a it's, it's a pun, but it's a decision made by one of the characters that's like, "Oh fuck, that was it!" Like yeah. he just said it, and it's like you said, that's like the most movie shit, you know, where it's like, dude, you had to read between the lines, the curtains, they weren't just blue; it meant something else, you know. And like, I think that's why this movie got got better as it went along. You know, we talked. uh we talked, I forget when it was, a couple weeks ago, about the, you know, movies are kind of hard to stick the landing. And I think this movie, it's like, the beginning's like, eh, it's okay. And then you get to the very end, you're like, fuck, that was so worth it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Damn, why am I feeling this way after this movie? Like, I would have not thought that after the first hour and a half. And there's even a point in the movie where I think you could um, end it, and it would still probably be a good movie about, you know, in the same way that I, I, I did think that... um there was a lot of connections to like in the way that in the mood for love, how it's restricted, like you said, and almost forbidden love in a different way. That's the other movie I kept thinking of. I was like, dude, this is a baby of vertigo and in the mood for love. Yeah. And like where it brings the emotion of in the mood for love, but it, it visually looks more like a Alfred Hitchcock movie. But also another thing that we had talked about um, prior to the podcast was how funny this movie is. Yeah. And like, I don't even know if it's meant to be so funny, but and maybe it's just like um maybe i just find korean humor to be like so much more blunt and um just like i just found it to be really funny and it's stuff that's not even like jokes you know what i mean yeah. like he's like i'm a detective but what i fear most is crime scenes that are full of blood i'm like that's not funny like that's meant to be funny right and i i don't know if it's just because the way you know the subtitles are translated that i'm not getting like wait, was that a joke or yeah. like that was just a really poorly done subtitle but yeah there's That's just true. quite a few moments in the movie like uh there's one moment where he's looking through the binoculars and his partner puts like a massage gun on his neck and he just moves it away without stopping yeah you know just there's quite a few moments where i was like this this has to be comedic right <laughs> it's uh, i actually think that one of the most funniest points in the movie is just like one of the lines not to spoil, we'll get into a little later but just that the reason why he really likes her when he says like it's just because he really likes his posture her posture <laughs> and it's just like i there's no way that that like you know it, it it is almost um a joke on how complicated the whole rest of the movie is for like you talk about like this guy is such a movie simp and i'm here for it though that's the thing is i they built up this character so well that I, I'm invested in how he feels and I'm like, all right, I, I do hope you get what you want, you know? 
Yeah, but then it wouldn't be satisfying. Exactly. And that's what this movie And that's when the director is yeah. like, "What? That's that's not what you actually Yeah, want. it's a, it's tragic ending. Um, what do you think? Should we get into the Do you want to do the characters? The, I mean, this is really the the, the two main actors are 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 stealing the show, you know, like yeah. it, it's because of these two that this movie is so good. So I did kind of want to talk about their performances. Sounds good. Um, so our main character is uh, Hai Jun. He's played by Park Hae Il. Uh, he's an insomniac detective. He works in Busan. He's uh, married to a nuclear power plant worker uh, that, who lives in the city of uh, or village of Ippo. Uh, her name is Zhang An, and uh, he only sees her on the weekends. Uh, they they talk about in the movie that there's this uh, thing called weekend marriages, which I've I've never heard of honestly, but that. Uh, you know, we're starting to see the the everyday stew of his life, and it's kind of it's kind of run of the mill at this point. You can tell he's been married to his wife so long that the the spark is not really there. She makes jokes about how uh, even if we're miserable, we still have to have sex once a week because it's good for your health. Yeah, things like that. You know, like he and on on top of the insomnia, on top of the kind of uh, lust for life being gone. Uh, also, because he's a detective, these unsolved cases. He's just kind of in a depressive insomniac state when we meet him yeah i mean he seems to not be able to sleep and i mean uh, it later is kind of touched upon how could you if you physically are keeping all these little tokens of these cases but i do think that even it kind of it, it is questionable the reason why he's even working so far away from his wife in the first place it almost seems like he's been unsatisfied for a while we it seems like we're introduced to this character i don't know like years of him making decisions to think that he like you know he's very unsatisfied with his life whether he seems to be a very good detective and very respected detective and a young detective um but he seems to be very unsatisfied with his marital life and and it you know guy guy points aside to be like not an ugly wife so (laughs) (laughs) i don't get why he's so unhappy right nice house yeah two houses it's a movie so exactly we're we're gonna find out you know um He's really his. I would say his call to action <laughs> is uh, his wife Homer Simpson. Yeah. His, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny that his wife is Homer Simpson. She works in the power plant. Not very bright though. Yeah. I would. Yeah. Not, she's extremely smart, but not very bright. You know. Yeah. She says a lot of things that are just kind of like, well, I mean, this is gonna sound awful. Be like, I guess I get it. Yeah. <laughs> like, she's kind of dull. <laughs> yeah. Very smart. Uh. Yeah. And also, I noticed, too, that they don't have any children, and they are not exactly, you know, spring chickens. They're probably yeah. in the 40s or 50s. Exactly. Um, but anyways, so he his his call to action is that uh, he gets a, a new case is opened. There is a mountain in, uh, in Busan, I'm guessing, mm-hmm. right? yeah, where uh, a man was either pushed or... Or fell off of a very, very tall, tall rock. Mountain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, these are going to be the two detectives working the case. Uh, uh, Hai Jun and his partner. I forget exactly what his name was. But another funny moment is when he uh, he blames his partner for why he smells like cigarettes. Oh, he's yeah. Like, ah, he's going he, he's he's to kill, kill me. me. Yeah. I did also think the fact that... Uh, he just couldn't get up the stairs. He's like, what, what good is it that you have a gun? You? Yeah, yeah, we can't even get up some like, stairs. These movies are definitely meant... Uh, this movie is meant to be at least a little funny. I think so. Um, so, you know, this is the beginning of our story. Uh, he notices that the man who died has all of these... Uh, like, well, he must have been a very possessive man because we see initials on almost everything, and that's going to come into play later with our other char- our other main character. Um so he's kind of gathering witnesses and things like that, and that's how he he finally gets to meet our other main character. Uh, her name is So Ray. Uh, she's played by a Chinese actress named Tong Wei, who I thought this was the best performance in the movie. Yeah. Right? For sure. Well, I don't know. Or do you think it's the detective? No, I do think, I do think it's her just because... Um She's the more complex character, yeah. that's for sure. I was going to say, quote, unquote, you know, she's the antagonist of the film at the same time, but being the love interest, which it seems like two very... I, I know this well, other... Well, this is a noir trope, right? She's femme the, fatale. Yeah, she's, she's a femme, femme fatale. fatale. So I think that we're big fans of the femme fatale trope here. I know I am. 
So, I, yeah, I do think she takes away the cake because, again, I think it just comes down to beauty has so much power and that's what kind of, you know, really pushes this film, why this simp is really trying to get this done. I did want to say, though, kind of going back to the mountain scene, that is pretty graphic. And, I, um, like, the ants on the eyeball was really good oh, shot. Yeah, that was nasty. And, I, and, I, and I think that that's what kind of some of the old boy stuff of him, like, you know, he's talking about, like, he didn't necessarily take a different direction, but kind of like a sidestep. But he yeah. still used those factors of what he knows he's really good at. The violence in this movie in certain scenes where it, it I understand why it makes it uh, more realistic or hit a little bit more uh, harder. Uh, I think there's, like, a, a shot specifically in the movie where they go back to his body or no no they're it's like inside the fish yeah so it's like through the fish eye mm-hmm. like literally and it just looks really disgusting and murky i really like i enjoyed that shot a lot you know speaking of the mountain i uh i forgot to mention this but you know when he we see that he's a very thorough detective right yeah um another thing i had seen Park Chan Wook say he told us to the Guardian was that he wanted to create a police officer who was free of hardness, so that you know he's not a he's not a Clint Eastwood type detective, you know, but that his identity is very much wrapped up in his ability to do his job well and with honor. And you know, before this, before the story that's about to unravel, he was a police officer who was free of corruption, right? Yeah, and he was uh, like we said, very diligent as well. So like the. This, I, I say this to mention a very comedic scene of uh, him traversing the mountainside with, like, I don't know, some kind of machine that helps you climb mountains, right? Oh, yeah. And his partner strapped to his back. <laughs> I'm like, bro, this is, like, out of the Emperor's New Groove. You yeah. Know? <laughs> like, that's for sure one of the funniest things that I've seen in a long time. That's true. And, you know, speaking of Alfred Hitchcock, it reminded me of something like uh, – or like the the way that the film was uh, shot, or like I'm guessing that CGI, right? It kind of has to be. Uh, mm-hmm. But I was like, this looks like something from like North by Northwest when they're climbing on the fucking the uh, the heads of uh, Mount Rushmore. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? I get what you're but saying. I was like, dude, this is so funny. It's a rear, rear projection, right? Yeah, it just it did. I don't know. I watched this movie in glorious 720p, so you know, I wasn't exactly reveling in the glory. Of beauty, you know, that's true. I had to, you know, I watched the modern equivalent of a VHS. <laughs> but uh, yeah, getting back to our other character, Tong Wei, she's definitely the the mysterious character. You yeah. know what I mean? We there's a lot, a lot of stuff going on with this lady, and this is one of the reasons I don't want to spoil the movie. Um, I don't know if it feels unfair because it's kind of hard to talk about her because so much of the plot and what's revealed is about her. Yeah. So like I, it was hard for me to write stuff down because I'm like, this is the really good stuff that like, I wouldn't want to ruin for somebody. Like I know, I know I want to talk about the ending because it's extremely important and it really does tie this whole thing together. Yeah. But the actual details of the story, I'm like, you just have to see this for yourself. I just think a general way to put it is, um, a, a thorough detective like him is obviously gonna. Before I, I mean, he's. It seems like he's very infatuated from the, the get go that he meets Literally her. Literally, second he looks at her, and he's like, "Oh my god!" You know, but he goes goo goo gaga. She's crazy, like, but um, speaking of Tom and Jerry, he's like his fucking heart is beating out of his chest dun, 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 dun. <laughs> when he sees her. He 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 did that one big uh one big puff. He rolled the cigarette and hit <laughs> yeah, that one big puff yeah. to impress her. Exactly. Uh, but it. it him being thorough and just kind of come i think the biggest biggest theme here that i enjoyed of the film is that being a pure um respected policeman and having to you know have those beliefs mesh against your true feelings that you have towards having a more satisfying life or a more i would say more exciting life it seems like for him and um how do you kind of navigate through that and i think that's kind of where the quote-unquote some of the corruption starts to um build but i think in the like in the way that she tries to solidify her alibi that's where a lot of the first and second act of the film kind of seem to a lot of the mysteries being revealed you know yeah and that's that like police procedural stuff that you would see in any detective movie yeah you know um to 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 describe this character and also do a synopsis of this movie at at, one, at the same time, I would like to reference the uh, Chris Moltisanti tweets on Twitter, mm. right? 
And, uh, you know, those are the ones where he he's always describing to Tony Soprano, like, what something is. <laughs> yeah. Right? And uh, Decision to Leave is uh, it's a movie about a detective who meets a lady who's so hot that he forgets how to become a detective. Yeah. Team. Seriously. <laughs> he's That's all. really what, uh, you know. It comes the, down to. The simplest, most uh, easy way to describe this movie. He fumbled the investigation. All because she was hot. hot. All because... Um, he had a real happy fantasies with her, not even the dirty kind. That's that's I and I think that's another point actually that we talked about that makes this movie um really solidified more like in the mood for love where almost uh, not being able to touch each other is almost more loveful. Like Dude, I might. it's that self imposed haze code, I'm telling you. I'm glad you brought that up. I would I, I wasn't really sure of how to talk about that but now the, now I've come up with the term for it. The self imposed haze code. Yeah, I I, I think it's it's challenging to try to project those feelings and it, it, like it's harder to just do it the simple way like you said a kiss and i love you but i think the way that that emotion is shown throughout the whole film like we we, we resonate with our male character in this whole film because we we sympathize for him we, we do understand i guess for some reason where he's coming from even if i don't agree or if i know it's a movie trope for him to think that he could just get what he wants but i i, I did think like even when he starts to um really be enthralled by her and thoroughly investigating her the way those shots are set up that's where i did really think it was um hitchcockian yeah and i want to get back to our female character a little bit i mean the things we can say about her that don't really give too much away is that she is an immigrant she's originally from china um the status of how why you know all of that of what she's even doing in korea is uh, part of the mystery and what's in question so we won't talk about that too much um she's married she was married to a noticeably much older man mm -hmm. right who was an immigrant worker himself he retired um that kind of stuff comes into play he's um, one of us he's was, on he, YouTube, was huh? he corrupt you know was he not corrupt um she's a caregiver she takes care for uh she takes care of these older women uh you know <laughs> that comes into play be like so yeah. you know everything about her is driving this story forward because you know she's the mystery to to solve but i don't really want it i i don't want to take that satisfaction away from any potential you know audience Viewer. yeah um to to shamelessly plug uh if you haven't seen this movie yet obviously go see it uh the easiest way to do that right now would be that as of december 9th this movie is streaming on mubi <laughs> this is not an ad actually <laughs> yeah, yeah but, but i wish saying, it was i do want people to yeah movie hit me up because i will do it <laughs> uh, I, do, I do just want people to see this movie and what they probably will not enjoy is that you know i went and looked myself that you can get a seven day free trial of this right now so I, hey man fucking get this come watch this movie for free and cancel that shit within seven days just i i want people to see this movie and i mean that's the easiest way to do it so. movie has a lot of the films that we did whoa whoa whoa, whoa man enough movie time, yeah, right? did, did. Well, this is just about decision to leave we're not, <laughs> we're not sponsoring this podcast so i was just saying did, that's did. the easiest way to watch this movie i wasn't saying let's fucking suck off movie you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I don't have it, so man, yeah, but exactly. I actually don't know what they have, but um, yeah, never mind. Drop that, drop that. <laughs> like, but um, yeah, this movie is very hard to not want to spoil because it is a very good film, and there is a lot to really break down if you wanted to get into the thoroughness of you know how the mystery is solved or unsolved or how whatever your take is on it. But um, we're hoping that a lot of people who are clicking on this episode um kind of get convinced to watch it because of this episode and maybe um if you're here because you have seen the movie we also are trying to kind of talk about it in a way that doesn't get spoilers yeah so these two characters you know getting back to them once they meet is when the story really starts to kind of you know, everything's really coming together. Oh. And, uh, well, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I just remembered another f really funny moment because kind of stepping the direction that you're going to uh, in the investigation, he buys the, the deluxe sushi box. And, oh, uh, and, yeah. and, 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 and his partner's like, is that the deluxe sushi box? The dinner, the dinner set? So sad, bro. <laughs> deeply funny. Deeply, deeply funny. Because he's like, he's like, we could cover that? Because he was telling him there's a scene before, he's like, go get lunch, nothing too expensive. Yeah. So I, and then, and even just in those co in those comedic moments, you're kind of already seeing that. I think at this point in the movie, it's not like um, 
the, our main character has kind of shown that he is infatuated with her yet. But you can see that the interest there is building. He is treating her different than yeah. he yeah. should. I mean, treat the reason her. you don't know that is because he's a quite dignified man. Exactly. You know, that's mentioned multiple times throughout the movie. Uh, he, you know, it, because it's an uh, it's a show not tell movie. You see that he's very dignified with all of his, you know, the people in his life besides his partner, really. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> besides his partner, he fucking shit for some reason. Guy. But you know, his wife, uh, the people he works with, even the criminals that he, you know, he does catch. For the most part, he treats them with respect, and it's part of that that honor that is later going to be just completely shattered and crumbled and. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> there is some ways we can get into that, but uh, this is where it all starts. And <sighs> what do you think of this like second, this like second act of the movie? Do you find it to be, I don't know, frustrating at all? I do, just because it's like it's from a from a uh, police perspective. Like, dude, this is the most obvious case I've ever seen in any movie. Yeah, there's all these little, there's all these, there's all these little things like the. Um, it's a willingness to not want to solve this case. because, and, and I guess that's why it's like a, it's it's frustrating in a movie aspect. The same way you said some of Hitchcock's characters are like, come, like, come on, Jimmy, come on, bro, Vertigo, be like you literally can't tell that that's the same woman. Are you a fucking idiot? Yeah. So, Jimmy, <laughs> you're you're Jimmy. <laughs> come on, you don't deserve this. Holy but, mackerel! Yeah, but I think that because. We know that his bias is already being changed here. It's it's he's being goo goo gaga over her. That that's why we get these faults in this character. And I think that's the reason why the movie kind of after rewatch it, it's it's valid. You know what I mean? I understand, but it is a a, a gripe. And I think that the se- the second act that um it is the weakest of the three, and um I think had the movie kind of just settled on its tone from the second act and uh, kind of just closed out on that. It wouldn't be as like I would like it just because we talked about the craftsmanship, but I don't know if I would think it's as well emotionally because the third act just brings so much. You know? Yeah, so I mean, the second act is really about the the downfall of our detective, yeah. right, and how he is no longer free of corruption and his involvement with uh, you know So Ray and you know how he's he's really committing like the ultimate sin as a cop, you know, I mean, <laughs> like he's, he's, he's becoming as, as like, man, fuck this guy. Yeah. You know, like from a police perspective, you're like, dude, how are you just like, what is going on? How I, it, it is such a movie thing where you're like, I really can't believe that this is happening, dude. Like, and I don't know. Cause I, well, I was going to say, even in the second act here, we get his boss, the, the chief, like I already think like, you're still on this. You yeah, know, like just yeah. like we already like this is go solve the other thing that we have that's way more important than this. And why are you still stuck on this? So like everybody is also um, there's there's a scene where he's like just because she's beautiful, foreign, and can't speak the language doesn't mean she's a murder suspect. Like oh, but you admit that she's beautiful, that you're treating her different because she's yeah, beautiful. Exactly. Had this guy been from like just a Chinese man, would you be seeing it the same way? And I think the second act just kind of starts, like you said, unraveling to himself that he is being corrupted and not even for money, but just for another satisfaction that he's not currently having for some reason. Um, how do you feel about kind of, you know, moving through this story kind of fast? Yeah, I mean, like you said, we don't want to spoil it. So it is, if we really wanted to break it down, it would be spoiler heavy and I don't really, we might have made I, do it. Think I agree with the decision. The to start with the spoiling. Yeah. Um, okay, so, you know, after all of this, this, like, beautiful, <laughs> these beautiful moments, these beautiful settings, these really interesting fucking editing choices, uh, I know yeah. one of my, mine and yours favorite things about this movie is how, uh, well, the detective stuff, like, how that's portrayed on film, obviously, because mm-hmm. it's always cool, but, um, I think our favorite thing was the, when he imagines himself in, so Ray's apartment or like when she's imagining herself or when she is following him because yeah. that becomes a thing later on. Uh, just how that shit is done, dude. Like, like this is such well done movie making. And like, that's what really got me going. Like whenever I would become frustrated with the story, that was really what would get me going. I'm like, yeah. fuck, this is why this is so good. You get hit a dream sequence real quick. Or I even think even when he starts to, when you start to see that she becomes infatuating in him and kind of finding out, Oh, where's the next case he's going to go to. We see that he is a really good cop and just not just a regular detective, how it would be sometimes, but they're 
um, American movies, but it seems like he's also very well trained and he gets in a physical fight. There's even a shot where he puts on this metal glove and I, I just the Chain way it was, glove. it's yeah. like the way it was shot. You know what you're talking about, the way he puts on the glove and shakes it and the way the camera just um, perfectly zooms in on him and just the way it's framed and then the way that um, reminded me of the Robert De Niro shots in Raging Bull. Yeah. You know, of him and bouncing in the boxing ring. And it's like, but it's such a simple thing, you know, um, it, it doesn't need to be that cool, but it is no, that yeah. cool. <laughs> and then we do get the scenes of him kind of wailing on the guy, but being, get the perspective from the female character and kind of know that she's also seeing something like, whoa, like, this is a real alpha, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, <God>. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so these two characters, man, the way that they, you know, fall in love, the way that they play with each other, that, I mean, that sounds funny, but the way, the, the games that they are playing with each other, you know, this, this is all the really just good stuff about this movie that I'm like, I don't even know if I could describe it in a way that's going to do it justice, so I don't really want to talk about it all that much, but eventually it becomes... <laughs> <laughs> what is what becomes obvious to him has been obvious to us this entire yeah, because, are you serious time. dude yeah. yeah right and um this is where the movie takes its you know its third act turn is that he finally comes to grips with the fact that he has been fooling himself into believing that this isn't what is so glaringly obvious and he tells her and this is where the like the self-imposed haze code comes in is that uh you know he realizes there's a phone with evidence on it and he tells her to toss this phone as deep as you can into the sea and just hide it so no one will ever find it. And that really is, is his omission of his, his love for her. And it's kind of where it ends for him and for her, it's where it really starts, you know? And that's, yeah, exactly. that's what catapults this third act that we talked about. That's so extreme. And so, so fucking good. Honestly. Yeah. He's, he's broken after the second act and shattered. And that's, th that's sh the word yeah. that is specifically used. shattered. And, Third act kind of just shows how he continues with his life trying to get seek satisfaction from what he does have. And he's sleeping less. And he's his wife thinks that it's because, you know, he's 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 physically becoming almost ill looking. That's yeah, the way I mean, be. because of this, like his omission of love to her that, you know, the I love you without saying it. Yeah, he really sacrificed it, like everything he stood for as a person in this moment. And like, yeah, obviously he really wa he really was shattered, and we see these effects over a year later are still just basically eating him alive. Like, like you said, he looks sick at this point in the movie. Um, the moment of go ahead, uh, like what we compare it to in the mood in the mood for love is where that like the dialogue, the lines that they say are so. Oh, there's like a <laughs> there's a joke on it actually, but they're they're poetic. And his partner tells him like, "Oh, when's your poetry book coming out so I can buy it?" But he, the, our main character, does speak just very dignified, like you said, and the lines that they say between themselves. It just seems like a the very respectable. Um, this movie respects its audience and gives you um, dialogue that is, like you said, it's not obvious, but it is very, very emotional and very, and it's so it's the correct verbiage to really transcend the emotions that this film is trying to get across to you. Yeah, and then, then uh, just going off of what you said, he uh, kind of carrying the story along. Mm -hmm. He's living with his wife now back in uh, Ippo. He has become a police officer there. He's still extremely unsatisfied with his life. And um, guess who comes strolling into town <laughs> right yep. after 13 months? Uh, his boo is back. <laughs> And uh, she's, you know, she's she's the one now who is pursuing him. This, yeah, I don't even know what to call this dynamic. You know, and I, this is this is some deep shit. This is what this is where it does become. I guess, like we said, we're we're doing more or less spoilers now for this act. Just we, we want to give the you guys a good episode because we do really like this movie. But I I think the fact that um how how wild of a decision she makes to have to see him and how later we revealed that she does feel like this is the only way to see him and the dynamic they choose to have for each other, which is like suspect and pursuer, you know, which is really almost, it's about the chase mm -hmm. for them. Like that's, that's the love relationship is the chase. Yeah. It's, 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 some weird or she shit. also becomes so 
when she does go over to his house in the second act, she sees how obsessed he does become with these unsolved cases. And like, she I want you to be, be that this. obsessed with me, even because we can't have this regular love dynamic because I, I, I am a constant reminder of your shortcoming in your career. But and I do not. want you to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you having the picture of it. Because they, I, I even think in the simplification of the, the pictures he chooses to burn and not burn. Even the those decisions, those small decisions there, I think really do end up reflecting on the third act more of why she almost seems like, wait, I actually think I like this guy the whole time myself too. So it gets twisty and turny and <laughs> it, 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 this is where the detective stuff, not even the t- detective stuff, but just, you know, the whole mystery noir aspect of the film, just like, what the fuck? You know, it, it's this is usually either good or bad in these movies yeah it's like it's this information dump of like this is what was happening the entire time or this is what happened in the whole last year to that led up to this so that's why it becomes like you know kind of dizzy you know what i mean like holy fuck this is like what the hell really just happened right now it's also because i think one of the the to agree with you on that point of why is because she actually is pretty fucking like what's the right word i want to use here like not evil but she's she's a genius in knowing how to off people like she knows how to make like the, she, she really she's is as good of a killer as he is a detective. yeah <laughs> and it's all and like because they're so perfectly matched and they're the way is funny meta to the craft is um that's why they're almost like meant to be with each other it's like the perfect type of match like uh we could have this dynamic because nobody will kind of you ask any other cop to give her and her alibis will stand but it's just because he's so good that he was able to keep no but i know there's something here but it's almost like he's trying to find something to upset himself because it's like he would he, he could easily just have forgotten about this but it's, it's it's eating him up he's too dignified of a person yeah i mean do you, how would you describe the ending of this movie like uh if i had to be like okay tell me how this movie ends like, i think like you, it, yeah you say? honestly it was pretty emotional because like as i was watching it i guess it's the it's such the movie trope of knowing that whatever people do think love is or love really is to people is that feeling that somebody would go out of their way to do all this just to really have you obsessed with them or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think to have that be lost in the way that it's physically done here at the ending um, is almost very sad or very like, um, well, it's extremely tragic. Yeah. I think it just kind of really shows that um, there's certain people who aren't allowed to really have their happiness i guess and the um yeah it's tragic honestly like on the second watch i did find it to be much more emotional actually than i did on the first time and i guess it's because it did really resonate with that um hope for love kind of like a feeling honestly i this is such a hard thing because i want to talk about it but it gives away like it gives away everything yeah you know? but like how do i really bounce around this like, i will say it's it's, it's also know, do you think it's okay if i bring it up yeah i think it's All right, fine this is extreme spoilers now at this point so once once she becomes a suspect again um and he decides he's gonna do his job the right way this time <laughs> yeah he uh he's, you know, he's pursuing her now as an actual suspect in a, in a in a crime um they you know they they speak one last time she admits everything right and um she decides that she's going to unalive herself you yeah know what i mean she uh she and she does it in a way that is very personal <sighs> I would say poetic poetic. Yeah, for sure. Because of like, we're not, we haven't talked about it yet, but there's like a, there's a theme, the, some of the themes and motifs in this movie of like mountains and sea and the sea, mm-hmm. you know, and like how these things come into play. Um, it, like you said, it's poetic because that, that is how this movie ends. It's like a, a mountain meeting the sea, you know, um, she, she confesses her love for him. Finally, you know, he, he doesn't really understand. Well, he, he, you know, there's a very kind of like, not corny or whatever, but just there's a line about, he's like, well, I never said I love you. She's like, yeah, but I know that you love me because of what you did, you know? And this, this ending is like really fucking ridiculous, but <laughs> it's so satisfying because it's a movie, but this choice of like, I'm going to bury myself in a hole in the sand and I'm going to drown by the ocean water, like going over me. And then this man who's in love with me 
is looking for me and he's standing over me and he doesn't realize it. I was just like, How? what? <laughs> Again, I'm, like, I'm also going to always I, be. I, and I made that sound bad. So <laughs> it's like I'm always going to be an unresolved mystery for him, you know, and just also just just gone. And like the earth just swallowed you up. And I, I think uh, there's like the poeticness that I was talking about is even as simple as the shots with because it's um it goes from light to dark, literally in the whole um last 10 minutes and um it's just so it goes from visual like having hope um when you first see the water um coming and taking her in then like maybe he'll find her on time or something and then it's just turning into dark and having no hope and knowing that this is just going to be another case that's unsolved for him but it's gonna who who's to say how much this was going to tear him up you know yeah i mean i wanted to talk about this ending so bad but i i so bad that i didn't even put any thought or care into how i was going to get to it you know right so like i feel like i did a horrible job explaining that but it, it just it has to be talked about you know like if if anybody had seen this movie that i knew in person <laughs> i would be like bro let's talk about the ending like what the fuck um just extremely extremely satisfying at the end um so I know we didn't really talk about the actual story as much as we would maybe some others, but it's because that is where, you know, all the entertaining, all the entertainment really comes from in yeah. this movie is all those small details. But um, another thing I really wanted to touch on was those themes and motifs of the mountain and the sea. I mean, it's it's everywhere in this movie. To the wallpaper too, right? That was one of them. Yeah, I was going to bring them up. Um, so... I would say the mountain represents Hai Jun and the sea represents So Ray, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, because he is this, well, obviously before this, he was this pillar of honor and dignity. And, you know, much like a mountain, he didn't change much over all this time, you know? And all of the stuff we learn about her is very representative of, like, the ocean and the sea and how it's unstable and how it changes. It's never the same. It takes you... The, she she showed up to Korea by sea. You know what I mean? She's got that sea wallpaper. You know, the fucking... The husband who dies in the beginning from the... You know, he dies on a mountain. You know what I mean? Like, these things are just all over the place like there's a point in the movie where the where the detective says like he's like you know i i think of myself as yeah. a sea person and his wife's like what are you talking about you were born in seoul so like i looked that up it's like there's seven mountains in seoul so it's like he's a mountain dude you know yeah. what i mean but it's just these small little like these this way of telling the story there's a confucius quote about uh wise people love the sea benevolent people love mountains uh the so Ray's grandfather having left her a mountain, you know, this is your mountain. You know what I mean? This is going to say later on. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a location used in the film for these two characters to kind of have this like really special moment. It's a moment yeah. Um, yeah, man. I just, uh, I thought that that was like the big, that was a, a big part of the structure of this movie was using, uh, symbolism of you know, mountains yeah. and seas. No, no, I, I did catch on that too, just because, like you said, it did seem a little just obvious because it's even in the wallpaper, and they di they discuss it in, in um, various ways, and I I think that just is where the story kind of I don't know if that has to do a lot with um, the culture as well, just Korean culture, but um, it just seems very well represented, or it, it just seems like those those motifs kind of venture across any type of culture you know? you know to use it to to bring up a humorous uh a humorous use of it is uh there's a there's a case a separate case in this movie of like a, what is it, like a, over a hundred or a thousand or something like that soft shell turtles going missing, oh, yeah. and then they find them on a highway just like abandoned <laughs> And uh, if it's if you want to even go there with that symbolism, that soft shell turtle that bites the shit out of him and won't let go, like that is so Ray, you know, a creature of the sea having her hold on this mountain man. You know what I mean? Like I even saw it there, and I was just like, damn, this movie is literally just it keeps hammering home that point of the ham of the mountain meeting the sea. And then that the reason I wanted to bring up the ending is because you know that final. Well, I don't even know if it's the final final shot of the movie. I can't remember, but that. This mountain that So Ray has built for herself by burying herself in a hole and watching the sea, you know, does make it dissolve. Is I was just like, oh, okay, that's that's the master touch right there. Yeah, you know what I mean. That's like, like oh, if you this is why he brought it up so many. If times. If you didn't get it, 
Yeah, if you didn't get it, you definitely get it now. And hey, maybe mountains aren't as uh, rigid as we think they are. You know, even they can be dissolved by the sea. The sea turtle um, analogy is even funny because the the wife brings up how that's what would maybe bring him happiness. Yeah, to make exactly. that connection. There you, know, you go, like, right? Yeah. Oh man, his Homer Simpson. <laughs> his Homer <laughs> Simpson. Yeah. So I I think we had talked about before um, when you had had the first viewing of this movie before you had kind of finished it. Um, and I hadn't rewatched it. We kind of felt that this movie was, yeah, like it was good. Like it was, it's a good movie. But I think after saying like a second rewatch on it, I do understand um, how this is a well-executed film. And this is really almost very exemplary of what we like to preach on the podcast of like, this is a good film. And this is somebody who wants to make films and somebody who is very respected for his style. And I think that the fact that nobody can make films like him is the reason why you really um, respect watching uh, international cinema. I, I think it's a different approach than in any American film that I could watch. Like you said, this could be a soap opera dynamic that would be a lot worse on TV. But the fact that you have a different culture and somebody, and in a culture that demands so much respect from you know their authorities, I think that kind of becomes, like we said, a, a haste code type of like self imposition. So, um, yeah, I ended up really liking this movie, and I think the third act really cemented. I was like, no, this really does um, carry itself really well. It's nice to watch a movie when you can tell the director really loves what they do. Yeah, because it doesn't. It doesn't always feel like that. It's there's, some there's some movies you see and i'm not gonna name any whatever and uh, no this isn't a shot at any particular studio this is just i'm talking about just all movies in general sometimes you throw on a movie it could be from any year whatever you'd be like did people actually did the people enjoy making this yeah i, I do and feel i feel like, like definitely definitely this is a movie made by someone who loves the art form and st and storytelling you know? yeah uh, he has a style so solidified and there just seems like a lot just to add to your point like um you know you could throw on any of the random tv shows that exist and a lot of those actors on there does seem like well they're actors so they're trying to get paid for their job but this here seems like uh, our actors here are chosen and they want to work with um somebody as dignified as the director here and for a reason, and I think it's um, roles that will live on longer than a lot of the other stuff that people watch. I think they're relatable past certain eras. I think this film um, can be watched in 40 years from now. You can still take things from it. It's not very like, um, I think some of the years that it's showing on, there's 2020, and it, there's nothing aged about it, you know? Yeah, this is a very good movie. I highly recommend this movie. Um, I'm not surprised to see it ending up on so many people's list of like their favorite movies of the year. Mm -hmm. um, we're in December, still a lot of movies left to see. So I, I, my list is not ready yet. And I'm, um, but at the moment I'm like, Ooh, is the, is this on there? Is this not on there? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, that's a tease for a, a future episode. <laughs> uh, and yeah, man, just talking about what you were saying, like the kind of stuff we like to preach on this podcast, I did think now was a good moment. Uh, to bring up this movie because it's because yeah it, it's streaming now so people can actually watch it yeah who didn't get a chance to see it and it's just like this is a if you really if you're one of those people like oh man i how come they don't make any good movies or i never get any good movie recommendations this is the the, the type of movie you should see you know it's it's challenging it's a little frustrating it's uh, extremely satisfying by the end it's uh story driven it's character driven it isn't just a piece of entertainment you know it's a real it's a real capital C cinema film, you know? Um, and yeah, I mean, this is the kind of movie where I'm like, yeah, I do want more people to see this. So this is, in, this is important shit, dude. <laughs> some of our, uh, some, one of our favorite directors that we just have been saving for a long time, um, made a good point on this hits from the bong. Mr. Uh, bong Joon Ho. Well, um, you'd really do discover a lot more if you could just read one line of subtitles in these movies. Um, we did drive my uh, drive my car last year. Was that this year? That was I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Don't Anyways, know. but the, a lot last of these year. films like they really do present um, an outside American perspective, and I do think they are way more built on character development and story. And, yeah, and story it's not and entertain. It's not as I wouldn't I wouldn't say that they're not entertaining, but entertainment is not the main focus focus All right, i think they do it in different ways like you said it's comedic and uh we talked about we talked about the whaling this year another korean film but like the way that they 
imposed um, emotion and the way that they find other ways to entertain you, I think, is good when you want to change up the type of uh, film that you, you know, take in. And like he said, Bong Joon-ho is uh, if you just kind of aren't too scared to read a couple subtitles, I promise you that you'll find yourself in love with the whole different um, type of movie or different or experiencing types of films that maybe you didn't weren't really getting with the current landscape. I mean, I can't really we've talked about a lot of good movies the past couple of weeks, um, a lot of high end movies, but um, it's, it's very selective. The ones you could really honestly compare to a movie like this. I mean, like you have like Banshees of Anishra and they were going to end up talking about, but those are just one of the, well, that's an international movie. So it, it is just really does seem like something like tar is the only thing that really pushes the same type of, I would say, brain involvement that a movie like this does <laughs> <laughs> brain involvement yeah so i mean in the words of uh the master martin scorsese man expand your palate you yeah know? uh you know don't be scared to watch things that are you know not exactly something you would think of you know just that was that's one of the best ways to enjoy films you know is to kind of just go in and be like well what what is this like i've 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 never heard of this or maybe i've heard about it just through word of mouth but you you will most likely be extremely satisfied if you put on a movie by park chan wook (laughs) i think i I think another just good point to kind of prove that is that for example people really it, it broke that and kind of became obvious to people for like squid games and obviously people ended up finding out that like I that language barrier shouldn't be something I'm scared of. And I think that that language barrier needs to kind of be broken a little more. I know Parasite kind of broke it in general, you know, but I do think um, in, uh, people in general need to kind of see it that way, too, with these movies that maybe don't get as well promoted out here. Like you said, I, I haven't seen the trailer for this movie and I don't think I ever saw a trailer for this movie in any of the theaters that I went to for any of the films. So that's also i feel like something that as americans we could probably improve on the fact that this movie isn't even being promoted yeah definitely man i mean don't be scared of some subtitles go ahead and use your brain power (laughs) (laughs) uh and uh, you you know you'll be better off for it 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 fulfills the soul to watch good movies you know Mm -hmm. so there's a whole other world of movies out there that you probably have not even thought of yet that are just waiting for you to enjoy them yeah, you know, imagine if you weren't American and you were like, nah, I never watched that movie Goodfellas because I don't want to watch the subtitles. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? And, and I'm just saying if we sat here, we could really receive the message that this film is trying to put out. Like, I know this is a universal message. Yeah, I was going to say, like, I don't I don't really see myself as somebody who's quite that bright. So I'm like, well, if I could get this right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like definitely. I don't push up my glasses <laughs> when I'm doing this podcast. You know what like, I mean? Like, oh, I don't you don't think, understand I this? I never think that no. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm just smarter than you guys. And that's why you don't enjoy this. No. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a bozo, you know. And I'm like, and I found this entertaining. So I do think it's uh, it's accessible, like you said. Yeah, definitely. So I think that wraps up our conversation. Am mm-hmm. I right about yeah. that? Uh, make sure you like, comment, subscribe. Please watch this movie. Uh, there's no reason not to. It's very, very good. Uh, but like I said, like, comment, subscribe. Let us know what you think. If you've already seen this movie, definitely drop a comment. I would love to hear what you think, if you loved it, if you hate it. Uh, Grand Cinema Hotel, thank you for checking back in. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.